Drew Badger, the EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. And today we're going to learn some English phrases like a native. Make sure we got the camera working properly. We should All right. If you're live, post something in the chat. Let me know if it's working. We should be good to go. All right. Make sure we have this. All right, I think we should be. Boom. All right, we should be going. Hello, hello. What shark is back. <laughs> Lele, let's see. You're real nice to see you there. Okay, all right, we're going to get right into this because I know learners are interested in learning lots and lots of phrases. The trouble is most people learn things and then they just forget what they learn. So they're basically wasting their time and there really are much better ways to learn phrases. And I'm going to show you the native way of doing this, how native English speakers do this. And again, this is the same way that you would be doing this in your native language as well. So it should be a, an interesting video, uh, but today we're going to begin, as I usually do, where we're talking about particular situations. Remember that what most learners are doing, typically, uh, we have the English uh, as a second language approach. So the English as a second language approach, this is where we're going to usually uh, begin with some words or phrases in your native language. So you begin with whatever your native language is, uh, and then we're going to translate that into English. So we will begin with some words in your native language, whatever that native language is, and then we translate that. Or uh, if you're learning it in English, we usually get a definition. So most of the YouTube videos you will see, and really any kind of English lessons, it's not just on YouTube, uh, but it will be lots of phrases or vocabulary. Uh, you will get a quick definition of something, or if you're learning in your native language, you will get a translation of that. Uh, and then Hopefully you remember that information, but usually you do not. So learners will often, they spend a lot of time trying to get this information, but they don't retain it. So the point is, how can we learn the vocabulary and remember it so we use it fluently? Sounds pretty good, right? All right. So uh, instead of doing the ESL approach, so English as a second language, what we want to do is learn English as a first language. And anyone can do this. This is the same way natives will be learning vocabulary, and this is the same way you learn vocabulary in your native language as well. Even today, if you learn new things on the radio or TV or whatever in your native language, it's the same way you're learning with them, okay? So English as a first language, we don't want to begin with another language uh, or a translation or a definition. We really want to begin with a situation. So a situation like something happening, uh, like a marker drops on my head, what do I say? So we have the situation like a marker or something like a brick or whatever falling on my head. What is the vocabulary that I use in that situation? All right, is everybody clear about this? So the traditional way of learning, either we begin with a translation or a definition of something, and then here's the vocabulary that we use, so the target vocabulary. But natives, they're not thinking about specific grammar points or whether something is an idiom or a phrasal verb or whatever. Really, they're just understanding the situation, like something falling on my head, and then what's the vocabulary I use? So in English, in this situation, ouch. I would use the word ouch. But maybe in Japanese, I would say ita, itai, okay? So it's the situation being the same in both. So Japanese and English, a lot of people, you know, they get hurt. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but we use different vocabulary. So children are watching what parents do. They're watching what their friends or teachers do, and that's how they learn the vocabulary. So you can call this just learning it in context, but really it's just so you understand it, it's really from specific situations, okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to take this idea uh, and we're going to take a specific situation of playing card games, playing card games. So I have my Japanese deck of cards over here. <laughs> I took this from my kids. Uh, and so this is just a regular deck of cards, but we're going to talk about the vocabulary that we use while playing cards. So different card games, it doesn't really matter what game. It could be poker or blackjack or you know any other kind of game you play. Uh, but typically, uh, many of these phrases that we use in regular conversation come from poker. 
okay? Uh, but they do come from lots of other card games as well, and then they can be used in many situations. So the basic idea, again, we want to have situations, so we're going to talk about that, and so we have kind of like a core situation, and then we're learning some particular vocabulary connected with this. Like all these different things are connected to the situation rather than trying to learn some random vocabulary. So I don't want to go to YouTube and teach you like, here, here are like the top 10 most common phrases, all right? Because it doesn't really help you remember that information. It's just, okay, here's some random vocabulary. Maybe I will need that in a conversation, maybe I will not. But if you learn this way, it's much easier to find places or find times to use vocabulary. Okay, so you learn like a native. We begin with the situation. In this situation, we're talking about playing cards. Uh, and then we're gonna learn a couple of different phrases for that, but we will learn them naturally. You will see how they appear in a conversation or when we're talking about playing cards. And then from that, so we're going to cover five different phrases in this video, uh, and you will learn how to use them in many different situations. So it's important before we begin this lesson, I want to make it clear that you might learn something like a, a phrase might have a, like a beginning in playing cards. So it might, it might come from playing cards or it might come from war or sports or relationships or whatever, but often that vocabulary can be used in different ways, all right? <clears throat> So I might teach you, I will teach you some phrases, but we'll see how they can be used in different situations or different contexts. So I might learn a phrase like, uh, well, as a, we'll just get into it and I'll show you the examples. Uh, but this should be very enlightening for you because many people think, well, I don't want to learn phrases about this because I don't care about that topic. All right, that's not how native speakers are thinking. What we're thinking is, okay, here's a situation, how can I apply that vocabulary in other situations? All right, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's get into it. So the first thing, uh, usually when we are playing a game of cards, so you can imagine we're playing a game of cards together, and I am the dealer, I am the dealer. So I'll just put that up here, so I will, let me erase this. <clears throat> so we're going to distribute, to pass out, so those are phrasal, uh, phrasal verb, to pass something out, or we can just talk about dealing the cards, to deal the cards. So I'm giving you the cards, okay, here's a card for you, maybe there's a group of us playing, here's one for you, one for you, one for you. We're distributing the cards, I am dealing the cards. Now the past tense of this is dealt. So right now, I am dealing the cards. Yesterday, I dealt the cards. I dealt the cards. So the first situation we have in a regular make a card game like poker is I get dealt some cards. So I get dealt some cards, and we call this a hand. So this is a hand of cards, a hand of cards. So just like my hand right here. A hand, excuse me, a hand of cards. Pretty easy, all right? I want to take this step by step, make sure everyone understands. But again, everyone is passing the cards out, so everyone gets their hand of cards. So you can't see what I have right now. I'm hiding my, my hand, okay? So the first thing we begin with, the first phrase I want to teach you is, we all play, so to play the hand, the hand to play the hand you're dealt. To play the hand you're dealt. Now the basic idea of this is you don't know what you're going to get. So I have my hand of cards, you have your hand of cards, someone else, the other players have their hands. Maybe it's a good hand, maybe it's a bad hand, maybe the other players don't know. Especially in poker, really, we talk about playing the man. So you're talking about how you kind of use some psychology to play the other person. So even if you have a bad hand, we can still talk about playing a hand well. But the important thing here, the first sentence I want to, or the first phrase I should say is, to play the hand you're dealt. To play the hand you're dealt. Now this just means, again, you might have something that's good, you might have something that's bad, but you do what you can with what you have, okay? So I can't change the cards that I have in my hand. 
I can't change the cards. Now there might be some games where I can exchange them with other cards or I can change them with, you know, exchange them with other players, but basically I'm dealt a certain hand and these are the hands or this is the hand I have, okay? So we take this idea, so we have to play the hand you're dealt. So I'm dealt a certain hand and now we can think about that as how do we apply that in other situations? All right, so the basic idea, we're talking about a hand of cards, but we can apply this in many situations. For example, I can talk about, well, I don't really like, uh, I don't know, like the, the area I'm living in. Like, let's say my parents move to a new place uh, and I don't like my school and I don't like the area and, you're, and the, you know, the parents just say, well, uh, you play the hand you're dealt. You play the hand you're dealt. So they're talking about me, so they're telling me, ah, you play the hand you're dealt. So it means you don't have any control over that, but you do the best with what you can, okay? So do what you can with what you have. Does that make sense? So to play the hand you're dealt. So if I give you some cards, wow, maybe you have a, a really good hand. Maybe you got lucky, or maybe you did not, all right? But you do the best you can with what you have to play the hand you're dealt. Any questions about that, all right? So again, the first thing, we're just dealing the cards out. Everyone gets a hand, and so I play the hand I'm dealt. I can't play any other cards. These are the cards I have. I play the hand I'm dealt. And just like in life or in business or other things, maybe I'm talking to my, uh, like a boss at my company, and I say, hey, we don't have very many resources. We need more money for this project. And my boss just says, hey, you play the hand you're dealt. You play the hand you're dealt. So this is the situation we're in. We can't change it, so we have to do the best we can with what we have, okay? To do the best you can with what you have. Making sense so far? So we have the situation of playing cards, but you can see how it can be applied in different situations. Make sense? Okay. So moving on, uh, if we're playing our card game, now watch what I'm doing here. So imagine you have your cards, I have mine, other players, we're sitting around a table playing cards right now, and I'm, I'm looking at everybody else and making sure they can't see what I have. Maybe you've seen people play cards like this where they're really trying to protect what they have, they're trying to cover that so nobody else sees what they've got, all right? This is called playing your hand or keeping your hand close to your chest. So we can talk about playing or keeping uh, your cards or your hand close to your chest. All right, I'll write this one down for you too. So we have to play the hand you're dealt. So to keep, or you can say play your cards. You can call this your hand or your cards close to your chest. So this is my chest up here, and I'm keeping my cards close to my chest. So what does that mean? What's happening here? I'm keeping my cards close to my chest. I'm not just, you know, leaving my card just hanging out so everybody can see what I have. I'm, I'm keeping them close to my chest. Now, I could also be, you know, putting them down on the table. Some people, when they play cards, they're just looking at the cards like this. The cards are lying down on the table, and they look just to make sure nobody else sees what they have, all right? So if I'm playing my cards close to my chest, I'm playing my cards close to my chest, what am I doing? So what's the situation here? What am I doing? Just post in the comments. If you get this, it should be pretty clear, but I'm putting my cards or I'm playing my cards or keeping my cards close to my chest. I'm keeping my cards close to my chest. I'll keep moving if I don't get an answer, all right? but you guys should be able to figure this out. It should be pretty easy. So to keep my cards close to my chest, all right? Basic answer, I'm trying to hide things from other people. I'm being secretive. I don't want other people to know what I'm doing, so I don't talk about what I'm doing, all right? Remember, the basic idea, I'm not showing my cards. So I'm not showing my cards here, but I can apply that to other situations, okay? I can apply this to other situations. So let's say a friend of mine is asking me, oh, what are you guys doing with your company? 
All right, so I'm at maybe a business meeting with local people uh, in the community, uh, and we each have a business. And one guy is asking me, "Hey, what are you doing? Uh, are you are you building anything new? Are you doing something new?" And I I don't really tell him much. I just say, "Yeah, yeah we're we're doing okay. Yeah, we're working on a few things." So I'm being vague. I'm not really being clear and specific about what I'm doing. I'm pl I'm playing my cards or keeping my cards close to my chest, keeping cards close to my chest, all right? So it just means I'm not telling other people what's going on. Now, let's say I'm in a relationship or there's a girl I like or, you know, whatever the situation is. So I, there's a girl I like uh, and, uh, and I don't really want to tell her how I feel. I'm hoping maybe there's a situation where uh, I can somehow tell her how I feel, but I'm a little bit shy about that. So I'm keeping my cards or playing my cards close to my chest. All right. So it's just a way of saying that I'm not revealing what I'm doing. I'm trying to keep it hidden. I'm not saying very much or I'm being vague, uh, not being clear about that. Everyone got that so far? Making sense? Okay. So we've got playing the hand you're dealt. So I've, I've been dealt. I have been dealt a hand of cards and now I'm playing my cards close to my chest. I don't want other people to know what I have and I'm not talking about it. I'm not telling people, hey, I've got this card and this card and that card. No, no, I'm playing my cards close to my chest, okay? We're playing the cards close to my chest. Any questions about that? I'll keep moving if not, but this should be making sense. So again, we're talking about a basic situation of playing cards and these are the kinds of things that happen in a card game and yet we can still use them when talking about other things. Okay, this is how native speakers, they're basically building a network in their mind about different vocabulary by understanding all these things at the same time. So rather than learning some random vocabulary, they're learning this situation. So little kids are watching their parents play a game of cards and their dad says, oh, like, well, you play the hand you're dealt. I guess my cards aren't very good. I play the hand I'm dealt. And so they learn to use those things in other situations. But notice how it's much more memorable this way, all right? We begin with the situation and learn the phrases and understand how we can use these in other situations. Okay, next. All right, now this is another one. Maybe you have heard this before. Let's say I've got my cards over here and while no one else is looking, I've got an ace up my sleeve, an ace up my sleeve. Now, usually people would not play poker with a short sleeve shirt like this if they're going to hide some cards somewhere. So if I'm hiding a card up here and then I need to pull that out sometime, I've got an ace up my sleeve, an ace up my sleeve. I'll write it down for you. An ace, whoa, that's, Really sloppy handwriting here. And ace up my sleeve. So we have our sleeve here. This is a regular shirt sleeve and I have short shirt sleeves right now. Uh, but I can hide a card up here uh, and I can hide the ace. So the ace is typically the best card uh, in a poker game or often many games. It's usually the highest value card. Uh, but I can hide something like this, uh, and, but you notice like I'm not, in poker game, I'm basically cheating. <laughs> so if I take a card out, let's say I don't, I don't really like my hand, I don't like the hand I've been dealt. I don't like the hand I've been dealt. So in a sneaky way, I might tell people, oh, what is that thing over there? And then I switch, I switch the card with another one or maybe I hide it someplace else. So now I have a new hand, a new hand, a better hand, where I have, oh, I've got an ace, all right? So people typically don't hide, uh, you know, like a card up your, up your sleeve that, you know, would be like a two or a three or something. You could do that depending on what you're doing. Uh, but again, to have an ace up your sleeve. Yes, so I think someone just said a trick up your sleeve as well, all right? It's the same basic idea, but notice like it begins here where I'm hiding something, all right? So I'm hiding something and hopefully I can improve my hand with that thing. Remember, in poker or you know, any kind of card game where you're trying to cheat, this is actually cheating in the game. But when you talk about someone having an ace up your sleeve in life, 
So if I have an ace up my sleeve up here, I might not be talking about cheating about something. It just means kind of like keeping my cards close to my chest. I have maybe something I can do, an amazing thing I can do uh, that can help me win. And it could be helping me win in business or relationships or war or whatever. All right, so let's say I'm in a war, I'm actually fighting a physical war with someone else, but they don't know about some new laser technology that I created. So my country has laser technology and the other, com uh, other country does not, all right? So the ace up my sleeve is the hidden thing, this hidden laser technology that the other country does not know about, all right? So while they, they think they're beating me, but aha, look, now I've got my special laser guns and we win the war. All right, so I had an ace up my sleeve, all right? So people might say, oh, do you have an ace up your sleeve or do you have another trick up your sleeve? So it, it just means, again, something maybe you're hiding from other people, you're protecting that, but you're not necessarily cheating when you use this in real life, okay? Any questions about that? Should be pretty easy. All right, so we've gotten through three over here. We've got to play the hand you're dealt, to keep or play cards close to your chest, and we've got to have an ace up your sleeve, all right? So you could have a trick up your sleeve or something else, but it just means you're doing something that, uh, you know, you can, you can surprise everyone with some amazing thing or skill or whatever that other people are not expecting, all right? All right, so to keep moving, we've gone through three. We're gonna do two more. Uh, next one is to be all in. To be all in. Now, typically in a poker game, I might have my hand, and then each round, I'm, I'm betting on that, on that hand. So I'm betting that I have a good hand, and I'm trying to play, really, the other players in the, uh, in, the, in the game, even if my cards are not very good. So I might bet a lot of money and make people think I have a really good hand, and maybe they know I have a good hand, or maybe they don't. That's why poker is an interesting game. All right? But if I'm going all in, it means I'm taking all of my money and putting it in the center and I think I'm really going to win. So I'm challenging the other person. Either they're going to be all in too or they are going to fold their cards. So they're going to put their cards down and, and exit that round. All right? So that hand of, of poker. So if I'm going all in, it means I'm doing everything in that situation. Uh, I'm, I'm putting all my risk there. I'm putting everything uh, into that game, I'm all in, all right? So it means like some people, let's say again, another business situation, uh, I might be talking with someone and like, I'm a little bit hesitant, a little bit maybe nervous about, uh, you know, what should I do for, uh, for, for a contract or a new, like a business decision, but you see, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about that. All right, so I lack confidence about that thing. But another person who's uh, maybe ahead of their company, they say, okay, we're going to do this and we are all in on that thing, okay? So a company like, uh, so Steve Jobs was an example of this. Uh, I believe uh, this is the story if I'm remembering it correctly. But uh, when Apple, uh, or Steve left Apple and then he came back to Apple and he was explaining to people, okay, we have all these projects or different you know, uh, programs or whatever, different products that we're offering to people. He said, we're just gonna go all in on four things. That's it, we're going all in on these four things. So we're gonna make a computer for business, a computer for people, and a tablet, and I don't know, something else. It doesn't matter. But the point is that we're going all in on that particular thing. So just like I have my, I have a stack of poker chips in front of me on the table, I'm pushing them all in, okay? So I'm all in on something, all right, to be all in. Now notice I'm not worrying about, as a native speaker, like, well, is that an idiom or is that a phrasal verb or is that something else, like a proverb or whatever? It doesn't matter. Natives are not thinking about that. All they're doing is connecting a situation to the vocabulary. Okay, I'm connecting the situation to the vocabulary. Does this make sense? All right, I'll go back and check uh, comments in a minute, but I want to get to the last one, uh, but hopefully this has made sense so far. Again, we have a situation, a general situation about playing cards, and it could be any kind of card game, and we're learning lots of vocabulary for that card game, but we can apply this in different situations, okay? So just because it's a card, like card game vocabulary, that doesn't mean you can't use it in other places. 
okay? So remember that the whole point is to make connections. How can I use this when I'm talking about dating or uh, relationships in business or sports or whatever? I could be buying, I don't know, sheets or something like that. So I go to a grocery, well, not a grocery store, but a, like, a, uh, like a bedding store, a home furniture store. And I don't have like much money maybe, uh, but I really like comfortable sheets. So I'm going all in on this, I don't know, like 2000 thread Egyptian cotton sheet, I don't know, set, something like that. All right. So I'm going all in. It's like I'm spending my money. I'm gambling. I'm risking a little bit, uh, but I'm all in on that thing. All right. And then you accept the consequences of that action. All right. Now, the final thing we have. So the last phrase over here is, we'll show it to you first. All right. So I have my, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five cards over here. Actually, let me switch, make sure I have the right cards. Okay. All right, so I have my cards over here. I've been dealt my hand and I play the hand I'm dealt. I think I'm feeling good about this one. Uh, I did not have an ace up my sleeve. I only had to use the cards that I had in this situation. Uh, and I wanted to make sure other people were not seeing what I had. So I'm keeping the cards close to my chest. I'm playing my cards close to my chest. Uh, and hopefully, when I go all in on something, I decide, okay, I'm betting on this. I think I'm going to win. I go all in. And now it's time to show the cards. It's time to put the cards on the table. All right. So when you put your cards on the table, to put your cards on the table, now I'm going to show you what I have. All right. So I might be actually showing other people or I just physically put them down on the table like that. All right. So to put your cards or we can just say cards on the table. All right, so cards on, yes, Egyptian cotton. <laughs> I've never tried Egyptian cotton sheets. I don't know if they're amazing or not. I actually like flannel sheets, so cotton, but uh, wherever that cotton comes from. So cards on the table. So I'm putting my cards on the table. It means I'm revealing the thing that I've been hiding or whatever, the project I'm working on or something. Now I'm telling everybody about it. It's public. Everybody can see that. Cards on the table. Cards on the table. So I physically take the cards and put them on the table. So these are all very easy to understand when you begin with the situation and learn them the same way natives do. All right. So see how they become much more memorable and you can actually use them in conversations. Okay. So it's about building these connections, understanding what these things are, and that's what led to use them fluently. All right. If you don't understand something, you won't be able to use it fluently. So in this example here, cards on the table, I can just use that in a conversation. I can say, okay, cards on the table, this is what I'm doing. Cards on the table, so I can begin a, uh, like a sentence like this. Cards on the table, comma, this is what I'm doing. Cards on the table, here's the truth. Cards on the table, I've been cheating on you. Oh no, all right. So if I'm, if I'm going to say something, if I'm, if I'm revealing a truth, you can see the many, many different uses we might have for cards on the table, all right? Or you can ask someone else, hey, uh, you seem like you've been hiding something from me. Please be honest. Put your cards on the table and let me know what, what's happening. So maybe I'm talking with my wife. She seems a little bit nervous. Uh, and I say, hey, cards on the table. What's going on? All right, so put your cards on the table or cards on the table, what's happening? And she says, oh, I scratched the car. <laughs> so I say, oh no, you, you, like, you, didn't, you didn't tell me about that. So she was, she was kind of keeping her cards close to her chest. She didn't want to tell me about that. She was trying to think of a way, maybe she could fix the car. Uh, she thought she had an ace up her sleeve, like maybe her friend could fix the car and me not know it, but she wasn't able to do that. So cards on the table, all right, now she's gonna tell me the truth. Cards on the table, all right? Any questions about any of this so far before we start talking about Egyptian cotton? Because <laughs> it looks like people are interested in that, all right? The basic idea, when you're learning vocabulary, it should be a couple of different things connected, okay? And we're trying to learn these things and understand what they really mean from the situation not trying to learn a translation or a definition of something. 
A definition is okay, a translation is worse, because then you will be thinking, okay, like to play the hand I'm dealt, like how do I even translate that into my native language? So you will be confusing yourself if you do that. But if you just understand, oh, like this isn't really an idiom at all. It's just like, you know, to play, play the hand that I'm dealt. Like I, I was dealt this hand and now I'm playing it. Very easy. Okay. So someone said, never put your cards on the table with women. <laughs> yes, so you can see how we can, we can use these in lots of different ways. So I can talk about them with business, with relationships. I might be talking about war. So especially if you talk about uh, diplomacy. So different countries are meeting. They will definitely keep their cards close to their chest. Even uh, countries that are maybe friendly with each other, they're not going to tell the other country everything they're going to do. Okay. So there are lots of good reasons why we can remember this vocabulary and then find ways to use it as well. All right. But did anybody, anybody not learn something from this lesson? Did anyone not like this lesson at all? Did they, did they not learn something from it? <laughs> all right. Let me know. But this is the lesson. Uh, and look at that. It only took us half an hour. I'm really glad it didn't take uh, two hours to do that because I'm going to lose my voice. But I will stay around. I'll go back and look at comments, but hopefully this makes sense. Again, you want to learn English as a first language. This is learning English as a first language. This is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we're really trying to help you understand things from situations, really trying to help you understand things the way natives do. So it's really not complicated. If you try to, if you try to think about idioms as, as like, wow, look at these complicated words, and even if the words are simple, I don't know why they're organized like this, there's usually some kind of story or origin where things come from. So I'll look at that. To play the hand you're dealt. Pretty easy. So I get dealt a hand and now I'm playing it. I'm playing the hand I'm dealt. But the basic idea, the deeper idea of that is that I use what I have and that's all I can do. So if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, I don't know, but that's, that's life. That's what I have to deal with. Okay. And sometimes you might have <clears throat> an ace up your sleeve. So you might be in a situation where you're hiding something or keeping something a secret. And then at the last moment, you can take that out and then show everybody and say, look at that. And look, and now everyone is very uh, impressed. Oh my goodness, look at that. He played an amazing hand. He pulled an ace out of nowhere, even if I'm not cheating. So I'm not cheating in real life if I'm, even if I pull an ace out of my sleeve or uh, a trick out of my sleeve. Uh, but that's the basic idea. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, let me go back and look at uh, questions, comments, uh, and then we, we'll talk about Egyptian cotton. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. So everybody, nice to see you. I'm going to go through some of these uh, quickly, see if anybody has any uh, specific questions about this. Uh, I like your channel and the way you teach. Nice to see you again from my benefactor. Nice. All right, very good. Uh, Richard says, hello from Columbia Dad. Or Colum Columbiad? Columbiad? Or did, maybe you didn't spell that correctly. Hello from Brussels, Belgium. Look at that. Uh, hi from Planet X. Not so far away from Earth. Nice to see you there. From Earth. Earth. Hello from Mor Morocco. Hello uh, to my favorite live lessons. Glad here. Uh, I like you. Thanks for helping me. So you would say thanks for helping me. Thanks for helping me improve my English. It's my pleasure. Serena says, hello from Mexico. Hassan, keep moving. All right. Kevin says, what is your philosophy of teaching children English as a foreign language? Seeing them only once a week for 40 minutes to one hour. Do you have an approach uh, that is different from how you teach adults? No. Actually, the, the same thing I do with kids is the same thing I do with adults. And I would recommend if you can only see some students for a few hours or even one hour a week, I would give them some other things like YouTube videos or whatever that they can watch. So I'm still teaching people the same way, just like I would be teaching my daughter. So actually, I was, reading, uh, I was reading a book with my daughter last night, and in the book, they were talking about remote, it was remote, remote lands, remote lands. 
So the key word here was remote. And again, when I'm teaching my children, I will ask them lots of questions and we will try to do this. We will try to build this network around certain ideas and try to help them make connections in their minds, all right? So remember that when you only get one example of something, even as a native speaker, it's not very memorable and you don't really understand what it means. But when you get more examples over time, that's what helps it makes it, uh, make something memorable even for native speakers. This is why we want to connect a whole bunch of things together. It's actually easier to remember more things like as a story than trying to learn one or two phrases and, and they don't have much connection in your mind. So in this example, yesterday I was reading a book with my daughter and there was a story talking about hunting dragons in remote lands, so remote places. And I asked my daughter, uh, this was Aria I was reading with, I said, what does remote mean? What does remote mean? And she thought for a second and she said, oh, like the, the remote for the TV. So we have a remote. You know, it's got little little buttons on it and a little, you know, my lovely drawing over here. This is supposed to be a TV remote, a TV remote. I said, very good. Yes. So a remote can be this thing. Why do we call it a remote, do you think? Why do you call it a remote or why do we call it a remote and she thought for a little bit more and she said well uh, I don't know maybe uh, yeah she didn't she didn't really have a good a good idea so I'm, I'm trying to guide her again I don't want to just give her the answer because I want to help her think about this and imagine it understand it like a native so I said okay well why would we use a remote why do we use a remote why do we use a remote and she thought and she was like well I guess I want to just push buttons on something I said well yes that's true you can push some buttons on the remote but the reason we use a remote is so we don't have to get up and walk to the TV when we want to change the channel so many years ago the TV so some of my younger viewers maybe you've heard about this I feel old now, uh, but we have a TV and usually it had like the buttons or, you know, the dial or something on here and you would get up and you would walk to the TV and change the channel on the TV itself. So this was a time before the remote control. Okay, so now we have a remote control. I can sit back and, you know, I'm clicking buttons on it and now the idea of remote is far away. Okay, so I'm explaining, I'm explaining to my daughter, look, we call it a remote control because it's from far away that I can control something rather than trying to, to control it right on the TV. All right, and so Ari is like, ah, I get it. So yeah, it's much easier than having to change the channel. That would be very annoying having to go to the TV. And now most TVs don't even have buttons right on them. Okay. But this is how uh, native uh, kids are learning, native adults are learning. This is how you are learning new things in your native language as well. So it's much better to get, uh, get this network. So we're learning things all in English uh, because I'm teaching you English, but this is the same thing you are doing in your native language as well. So you might hear something on the radio and then maybe you hear something later on uh, a TV show and then you read it in a newspaper. And as you get these different examples, then you really understand what something means. So if you just call this a remote, children will remember that this is a remote control because that's just what we call it. So they've heard this over and over again, okay? All right, but as they hear another example, it's with this second example that they hear, ah, okay, remote means far away, and that's why we call it a remote control. All right, that was a long explanation, but notice how it's better to spend more time with something. Most learners are very, they're very quick about trying to learn. Give me 100 phrases as quickly as possible and then I go to the next video on YouTube. It's a waste of your time for most people, all right? I didn't learn that way. Most of my students did not learn that way either. In fact, it's just a really frustrating process because you go, okay, I'm great. I'm going to watch this YouTube video and it's going to teach me 100 phrases and then after that, I can't use anything in my conversations, all right? Okay, so this is why if you learn like a native, it, it seems like it takes more time, but you have a fluent vocabulary much faster. You can remember what you're learning and actually use it in conversations confidently. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, so I got that one. Hello from Brazil. Hopefully everything is fine. I'm playing my game with the cards hidden. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. All right, uh, so I like this method of teaching. I think it's a natural way to acquire language. Yes, so this is how everyone acquires any 
language. And you can do this with any number of languages. If you are a native French speaker or Italian speaker, you can learn English the same way. So remember that even people, like, you already know multiple first languages. So you might know a way of speaking with your kids or two kids, uh, or you might speak a different way with your boss. So you might have, like in Japanese, we have a, like a polite form and an honorific form of speech. And so these are all different languages. So I speak one way with my friends and family, another way with, with people publicly. These are two different languages and I use both of them as a first language, all right? So there's not like a limit to how many you can learn. Uh, let's see. But a trick up your sleeve usually means you are tricky or not trusted. Yes, uh, in general, I mean, you could, you could have a, it could have that meaning. You could have it, the meaning of it being like not so good. He has a trick up his sleeve, but you could also have that as a positive thing as well. It just depends on the situation. But the point is I'm hiding something and it could be a powerful thing that, that could be positive or negative. All right. Uh, I'm sure you remember Macy's. They used to sell it for a very, like a high price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So M Macy's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about to play your cards right? Yes, and this is the same idea. So another example, I could have gone over many other expressions for card games, but I just want to focus on a few of these. But I could also talk about playing my cards right. So maybe I... I I think I should get rid of these cards and get some different ones. Okay, I'm going to play my cards right, to play my cards right. And again, this just means to use what I have to the best of my ability. So if I play my cards right, maybe I can win. And you can use this just like in these other examples here. If I play my cards right with the girl I'm trying to marry or something. So if I treat her nicely and we have a good relationship, if I play my cards right, then we could have uh, you know, something positive or good or whatever. Same thing with business, same thing with war, all these things. Does this make sense? So there is not just vocabulary only for one thing. And native speakers are always thinking, how can I use this vocabulary in a different way? They might not be consciously thinking that, but they're understanding the situation and that's what allows them to speak fluently. All right, all right good questions though. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Yep, so do the best with what you can. We've got some people. Looks like Mr. Mario is in there enjoying the chat. All right, so never put your cards on the table. Okay, we got that one. Do you have, uh, do the best? Yeah, okay, we got that one too. All right. And, <clears throat> and nonsense, what he said about, okay, let's see here. All right, which books do you suggest to learn for English learners from A1 to C1? Uh, it's, it's kind of a, that question doesn't really mean anything, or what's a better way to say that? Uh, the, the kind of books you read have little to do with how well you speak. So many people, uh, I, I've, I've talked about that before, I actually have a, a uh, I did a recent live about what books you should read to become fluent, but being able to read and being able to communicate fluently are two different things. They're related, but you can be a good reader and not a good speaker, or the opposite. So let's say like me, for example, my spoken Japanese is much better than my ability to read because I don't know enough kanji. Uh, so I'm still slower about that, but I can just, I can speak normally. Um, and so when you're looking for like a specific book to read, the thing is more, what are the specific issues you have with communication? And usually it's because people are trying to learn things as a second language, not as a first language, all right? So if you're learning vocabulary and you forget it, that means you're not learning this way. You should be learning English like a uh, native speaker, learning English as a first language. And that's what will help you speak, all right? So I wouldn't worry about specific books um, for like moving from one level to another because you're, you're actually talking about fluency, not, not reading level. <clears throat> all right, let's see here. So you are one of the most effective teachers on YouTube platform. Thanks, my pleasure. Man, you're so right. All right, look at that. We got to the end of the comments, fantastic. Let me go back up here and make sure I didn't. All right, why do you always mention your daughter as examples about your dog, your wife, or your viewers? 
Why do you always mention your daughter as an example? What about, what about your dog, your wife, or your viewers? Well, I don't know what you're doing in your life. <laughs> you tell me. But I encourage you to use those examples, and I often will get examples from people in the chat. So if I'm talking about something and I say, well, tell me about your life. And this is what we do when we teach. We talk about things from our life, or if I know the student, I might talk about something from their life. Just like when I'm speaking with my kids, if I'm teaching them something. So I have two daughters, uh, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and when I'm teaching them things, then I will talk to them uh, about things that are important to them in their life and help them make those connections as well, all right? Just like we were talking about with the remote example. But there are lots of these. I could talk about you know, things in, in everyday life or maybe something I saw on a TV show uh, or a radio show or whatever. But I think a lot of people can relate to these examples. And I also uh, specifically like giving examples about how I teach kids and not just my own kids because it, it shows you that even a child can learn this. All right? So even a child can learn this information. That means anybody can. All right? Let's see here. Uh, all right. Yes, anybody else, if, if you guys are arguing in the chat, though, you're going to get kicked. So be kind over there. All right. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to face the IELTS exam in a few months. What point for speaking? Thanks from uh, Japan. Uh, uh, the thing I would recommend is you find someone who focuses on the IELTS exam or anyone else out there who has a specific test. What I do is I focus on conversational fluency, which will help you on the IELTS. But if you have to do specific things for that test or you want to get specific information, I would recommend you get somebody more specific, so someone who focuses uh, on that test. All right, remind me, please, what are the names of your daughter? So my daughters are Aria. I'll write their names up here. Aria and Noel. So Aria has been on the channel before. Uh, Noel, I think, is not. I don't know if she has or not, uh, but there are probably some photos of her, I think, on Instagram, maybe uh, English anyone on Instagram, uh, if you care. But anyway, it, it doesn't matter, but these are the names of my, my two girls. All right. Uh, are you a native speaker of English? I'll let you answer that. Noel is an Arabic name. Uh, I've heard it's French. I suppose it could be in diff different names as well. Raphael says, uh, what is the most difficult thing for Japanese when they study English? Uh, I'd say probably the two biggest things for Japanese speakers are pronunciation for learning English uh, and also just overcoming the, uh, the need to be perfect. But a lot of this is because the, the way people teach it really, it's, it's, it really is learning English as a second language in Japan, not learning English as a first language. So basically nobody teaches that way and it's just really difficult culturally for a lot of Japanese speakers. Um, so they, they worry about their pronunciation and, and, and that's because a lot of the English sounds are not in Japanese, like L and R, so lice and rice. They, those sound the same in Japanese, lice, rice. So it's a very clear, clearly uh, different for native English speakers, but it's a sound, it sounds the same in Japanese, like daisu, daisu. <laughs> so you don't know which one I'm talking about. Usually from the context, it's pretty clear. <clears throat> but pronunciation, uh, the grammar, grammar is not, not such a big deal. I mean, people will, people will ask questions about that. Um, but like some things are the same, so they're easier. Like you would have the adjective before the noun. I would say like a red car in English and akai kuruma in Japanese. Um, but the verb comes at the end of the sentence in Japanese, so that's a little bit difficult. It's like it's like uh, in English you would say like uh, pizza pizza eat. So that's the order in Japanese pizza eat. But in English we say eat pizza. All right. Uh, thank you for your live streams. They are really interesting to me, says Eunice. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you for your answer, says Hiroaki. It's my pleasure. As an ESL student, what should I focus on first? Vocabulary, pronunciation, or grammar? Yeah, you don't have to choose this. That's the great thing about learning English as a first language. It's not like vocabulary, 
or pronunciation or grammar, you actually learn all these things at the same time. So just like we're talking about this, like you play the hand you're dealt. There's grammar and pronunciation and vocabulary in this phrase. So this is how native speakers are learning the language. They're not trying to focus just like, here are some grammar rules. We want to learn the vocabulary and the grammar and the pronunciation all together. Okay, so this is learning English as a first language, and it's much easier to learn that way, uh, and you, you naturally integrate all these different things at the same time. Uh, all right. So as Richard says, my fluency get better day by day. Thanks, Drew. I feel so happy about that. Glad to hear it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yes, if you learn this way, uh, improvement is guaranteed, because how would you not improve? <laughs> It's, it's like funny to think about it, but see, uh, I, I think somebody, I, I answered a comment. There was a, uh, it was a recent YouTube comment that I answered earlier today. And this was a woman, I think, uh, I think she's a native Spanish speaker, but she was wondering how she can learn English because she wanted to communicate better with her boyfriend. And she said, well, he doesn't want to learn Spanish because he thinks it's too difficult. All right. Now, I know there are YouTube videos talking about what language is like the most difficult language to learn or whatever. But if you look at kids, little kids all over the world learn to speak their language at, at the same time. So it's not like this one language is, is like really difficult and then they only like they only start speaking when they're 20 years old or something. Most kids and pretty much all like 99.9999% of kids, unless they have like no mouth or, you know, physical problem or something like that, they all learn to speak. And so there's nothing really difficult about the language itself. It's just the way people teach languages. And so part of that is trying to trying to teach languages like it's uh, like a, a, a memorization example, like for a robot or something. So if I'm going to just give you a whole bunch of things, like I'm talking to chat GPT and I just say, chat GPT, like tell me all of the different tenses in English and chat GPT could tell me that information or Google could do that too. Uh, but rather than doing that, because it's not going to help me use that information, I actually want to understand it like a native. All right. So it, it's not about the language being difficult. It's not like Spanish is a hard language to learn. But if you can make Spanish understandable like this. Now, obviously, I'm teaching these things at a higher level for you guys because you all understand English at a higher level. This is not a basic English lesson. This is for people who already understand a lot of English, but just don't speak fluently. So I don't uh, I don't teach exactly the same way. Um, I would I would be very specific, just like if I'm trying to teach Japanese to a beginner. All right, so I'm using everything still all in Japanese to help you understand the language in Japanese, and it's the same principle, but we're just covering more difficult things. The same idea about learning English as a first language or whatever that um, that first language is uh, that you're trying to learn. That's what you should be doing. Uh, let's see. All right. So Mario says, I think the sounds of the Japanese language are very funny, uh, but I didn't like the writing. Not very complicated to decipher, but I didn't like the writing. Not very complicated to decipher. I don't know if it means you, you, you do think it's dis difficult to decipher or, or you do not. But uh, Do you go to the gym because you have a strong body? Uh, no, I do not. I just do a little bit of exercise at home in the morning, but that's all I do. Uh, I'm going to play my last card. Yes. So very good. So like if it's your last chance to do something, I'm going to play my last card. That's another great example. So you see lots of other things. If you watch a movie like Rounders or another movie about poker or card games, you will naturally hear all of these expressions. And then your mind will be, it's, it's like you're, you're ready to receive that information and then you will recognize it in lots of different areas of life. But please, please, please don't make the mistake that a lot of learners make of thinking that, well, that's just for card games. I don't need to learn that vocabulary because I don't play cards. Okay? You need to learn the vocabulary because it might come from cards, but it's useful in many different things. And the more open you are to the vocabulary, the easier it is to speak. Because I might not have a particular phrase for relationships. Maybe I don't know much about that. But I know cards well, and I could talk about that particular thing uh, or use that vocabulary in the situation. Um, let's see. All right, I'm going to, okay, we had that one. 
So Asina says, how do I improve my English and get fluent if there is no one to speak with? Yes, uh, Asina, as I just showed in this video here, I'm teaching you and you're getting fluent by how I teach you. So it's, it really depends on the ability of the teacher to help you learn. And if I can make the language understandable, you will get fluent automatically, even if you don't have anyone to practice speaking with. Isn't that exciting? So I can teach you if you understand the language well, if I do a good job of teaching, you understand and then you will feel more confident about speaking with other people. The actual communication with other people is a very small part of the learning process and most of it, like just like you're spending time during your day, unless you are speaking all day long to people, like you are a professional speaker and you spend a lot of time, most people are just getting input all day. So they're watching TV or they're reading newspapers or they're doing something. They're getting lots of input and after they understand things very well, just like the remote example I gave about my daughter, uh, that's when they're able to speak. All right, so it's not about like, like trying to learn something, uh, get a definition or a translation for something. We really want to understand it like a native. And then you don't need someone to practice speaking with. When you are in a situation where you can use your English, uh, feel free if you feel confident about doing that. But if you do not, it just means you're, you're not really very confident about the vocabulary you know. A lot of this is because people will learn a lot of vocabulary, but they don't really understand it very well. And that's why they can't speak, all right? So it's, uh, it's usually the doubts that people have or the nervousness, like am I worried about my pronunciation or the grammar or something, and that's what's stopping me from speaking. It's not like having speaking opportunities or whatever, because it's easy to find people to speak with if you want to. Um, and you can find them online or in person or whatever. Even if you live in a small town somewhere, you can usually find people online to speak with. It's not hard to do. I actually show, show people how to do that. Uh, but you can do that and it's much, uh, it's much easier if you just spend your time getting lots of input and really understanding things very well. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. So I answered that one. All right. So Vado says, I have learned so many phrases and vocabulary through MLB broadcast. It's cool. Yeah. So MLB is talking about major league baseball or she is Vado. Um, but yes, if you so if you even if you focus on one thing, we have a whole lesson set in Fluent for Life about baseball, uh, and and we we show you how all these phrases from baseball are used in all these other situations. So it's a very useful thing. So teacher, what do you think about learning third language via English? I really like your method. Is it close to it? I don't know what you mean by learning a third language via English. You should learn Japanese in Japanese, learn French in French, learn Persian in Persian. So don't use one language to learn another one. You should just learn that language all in that language. The really tricky thing is that most people don't teach this way. So it's hard to get that information. So I've made this available for English learners. Uh, other people have asked me if they're like a, you know, a German or a French or somebody else who teaches this way. I don't know. Maybe there are people who do. I think probably more will start teaching this way. Um, but just like you learn English as a first language, you should be learning Japanese or French or whatever as a first language. Uh, let's see. And all right, Anne says, teacher. Oh, okay, I answered that one already. All right, hi, benefactor. I came from Germany too. Let's see. I notice you're really clear in your speech. Are you a real native speaker? What do you think? What do you think? Do you think I'm not a native speaker? Now, the interesting question is does it matter? Does it matter? All right, so if I'm speaking very well, does it matter if I'm a native speaker or not? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I think some people in the chat can answer that for you. <clears throat> Fanny says, uh, thank you for your classes and greetings to your little daughters. From your point of view, how many times should I spend every week to improve my speaking? You should be spending some time every day, even just a few minutes. So in Fluent for Life, what we do is have people spend at least 15 minutes a day doing something. So you should be just following the steps of the program every day, at least 15 minutes a day, because it's much better to do that than to get no contact with English. But you don't have to speak. You should just be getting lots of input, or you're maybe writing something. You can try to speak with the lessons as well, but the most important thing is to really understand that. Uh, and this is why we also just answer questions if people have them about that. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, Mario says, I'm not a native speaker. It's a long way before I become a native speaker. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Himadri, you are one of the best teachers on YouTube platform. Thanks from India. Glad to hear. Why don't you talk about politics in America? <laughs> I think there are too many people talking about politics in America. Um, but if you have a specific question, you can let me know. This isn't really a channel for that. Uh, but yeah, if you have questions, I don't really know what the, the political affiliation actually would be interesting to know that for the people who learn with me. Um, but yeah, I don't, again, like you can, all, all of these phrases uh, that we've talked about today can be used when talking about politics as well. So especially politicians, I gave an example about maybe two countries during a, a meeting of uh, like a president goes from one place to another, maybe he keeps his cards close to his chest. He doesn't talk about everything. He's being a little bit more secretive or maybe this other, they're negotiating about something, but one guy, the other president has an ace up his sleeve. So he thinks, oh, uh, like this, I know the president really wants this thing, and if I can give him that thing, maybe we can we can get what we want. All right. So Foley says, "Why films seem hard for me to understand, even though I can understand native?" Uh, it depends. Usually, the the native English that you find in real conversations, movies, TV shows. Uh, and especially music can be really difficult if you can't see see people see people's move, like mouth moving. Um, but usually it's because the speech is fast, the vocabulary is difficult, or the accents are hard to understand. And so I'm speaking particularly clearly. This is why it's so important to, to learn the language with somebody like me, but then to also get lots of native examples. So this is what we do in Fluent for Life. So we can help you actually learn the real way that natives are communicating, uh, but you do it in steps. So you don't just like, if I just drop you in a conversation, uh, it will be pretty difficult for a lot of people to understand. But if you can do it in steps, it becomes easier. So you're learning the vocabulary and you're getting used to the accents and the speed of the language. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh my goodness, we're getting like a lot more. Let's see. All right, uh, let's see, Newton, good morning. A ref again for native speakers of Spanish. It's very easy to learn Portuguese, Italian, and French because, yeah, because of the Latin root. Yeah, so it's similar for, for Japanese people learning Chinese or the opposite. They have the same written language or part of it anyways. Uh, yes, I could speak French, so Spanish and Italian is easy. How you play the hand you're dealt, man, how to face every day in your life, so many different contexts. Yep. So again, the, the vocabulary is very useful, and that's why I'm teaching it. I don't want to teach you something you can't use in your conversations. But if you're, if you're smart, if you're clever, if you're listening, then you will, you will figure out easy ways to use these. Uh, am I planning to learn Spanish? Uh, well, I, I learned a little bit of Spanish. I failed Spanish, actually, because I was learning it the traditional way. <laughs> Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe in the future. Uh, I'll teach uh, someone English for Spanish. Let's see. Uh, I can understand Spanish and Portuguese, okay, uh, but it's India. Let's see. You're an amazing teacher, says Showtime. Glad to hear it. Cruz says, thank you for your lessons. They are very useful indeed, in your opinion. How long does it take to learn English and to be fluent at a higher level and use all four skills of communication? Uh, again, you can get fluent like I just showed these. If you remember these and you feel confident about them, you actually get fluent in individual words and phrases. Uh, you can do that almost instantly. It just depends on how long you need to review something. So like the example of the word remote that I taught to my daughter. Now technically, I could say, because she already knew what a remote control was, but she had not heard this uh, specific usage of the word remote lands or remote places. So maybe that's like, it took her, I don't know, three years to get fluent in that, but it's not really true. What happens is the first example of, of a remote control, she learned that very quickly, but she didn't learn the word remote until she got that second example. So what we do in Fluent for Life, the whole point is to make this process much shorter. So we want to give you a bunch of examples that help you understand something very quickly rather than try to, what the native way of is like, you know, you, you, so it, it's really not very efficient. So in this way, like, I can't, I can't be truly efficient with my children because there are always new things they're learning and I can't sit there and give them thousands of examples all the time. Uh, but I can be more efficient with English learners because I know specifically what they need to learn uh, in the situations we're teaching. 
Uh, but again, if I had taught my daughter remote control and remote in the same conversation, then she would have gotten fluent in that vocabulary very quickly. So there's not like a, a time limit or something about how quickly you get fluent in that information. Uh, and then you could be able to read, write, listen, or speak that uh, information or listen to and speak that information. So in general, what we do in Fluent for Life is we have people go through a whole lesson set, which is built around a conversation, but it takes you through that in steps. Uh, and you get fluent in that conversation in like 30 days or less. Uh, but again, like to be, you don't really get fluent in the language. You just get fluent word by word as you learn more. And that helps you communicate fluently in your other conversations. Uh, greetings from Mexico, by the way. Uh, but the sounds of Japanese language is pretty cool. Yeah, I, like again, I, I think Japanese is a, is a nice sounding language. I'm Ahmad from Philadelphia. Nice to see you there. Fanny, again, I have another question. What do you think about learning English using poetry? Thank you. I just listened to a podcast about that, but I would like your opinion. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I don't tell people only use poetry or only use movies or whatever. If you're interested in that thing, then keep doing it if it's helping you understand. How to understand phrasal verbs. Uh, search phrasal verbs on our channel and you will see that. Uh, this is what we do in Fluent for Life. The same thing is helping you understand these things like a native. So you should be seeing them visually, helping you understand them the same way children learn them. And that's how you use them fluently. Chang says, I'm not sure if it's the right time to ask, do native speakers still use this idiom in the pink? Is it in the pink, in the pink of health? Uh, we have a lot of arguments at school about it. In the pink. Uh, I've heard that expression, but I've never used that. It almost sounds more British English. It sounds like a, like a British expression. Um, so you might use that, but people might, like you would, you would have to be clear about the context of that. Um, but yeah, I don't, like, I don't know. I suppose people could use that. I would check Google. So do a Google search and then you can look at like the Google tools for uh, recency and see how, how frequently it's being used. And I think also like the n-gram or whatever they call it can track trends for that vocabulary. And you can see if it's going up or going down over time for, for people using the vocabulary. Uh, let's see, Arturo, nice to see you there. Uh, benefactor, again, I hope I can uh, put your paper because I want to say thanks to you, Drew, for your help and effort. I hope you can put your PayPal. Oh, are you talking about you want to like like donate some money or something? Oh, I don't need any donations if that's what you mean. But if you'd like to buy a course, we do accept PayPal for that. Uh, Duran says, how often do you stream in a week? Usually, like lately, once a week, maybe twice a week. I will not be uh, recording again this week, but next week I will. Uh, I'm, I'm okay. So uh, you are an amazing teacher. We appreciate you so much. Hey, glad to hear it. Uh, let's see. And, Let's see, Vinny Vaughn, YouTuber, he is American, so he is more than native, okay. Uh, I disagree with you, teacher, ha ha, okay. <laughs> Non-native speakers can make mistakes uh, so we can learn wrong things, so it does matter. I don't know what you're referring to, but like native English speakers make mistakes as well. The point is when you're learning that you should be learning with someone who can, who can teach you the correct thing. Uh, and help you understand it like a native, rather than trying to understand it like, uh, like a student. So you don't want to just remember like a table of grammar. You want to understand what's happening in a situation when people are using grammar. So if I'm doing something yesterday, then the situation is using that past tense grammar or you know simple ta simple past or um, a different grammar point, but you would understand that from the context. That's how natives are learning it. So most natives do not know the names like present perfect and uh, split infinitive and other things like that. Uh, only a, like a linguist or maybe a higher level college student that deals with that information would do that. Uh, so it's not necessary to know that to use it. Maybe Donald Trump needs to put his cards on the table. <laughs> of course, people who are not native as speakers of English make mistakes easily, even the language is easy and difficult. Yeah. Uh, to reply to my previous question, I think you're a real native speaker. Your accent is so clear because I understand you rapidly as a non-native speaker who has learned English. Yes, I am a native English speaker. But again, I want to make it clear to people that the reason I've become like a native speaker is because of how I learned. It's not where I lived or who my parents were. It's just how I learned the language. So I could take something.
someone else who was like born in Colombia or whatever and teach them a language and, and they would still learn to speak fluently. So they might not know like some cultural references or whatever, but I mean, they would, they would basically be uh, at least a fluent speaker, if not a native speaker. Martin uh, Polyglot. Hey, man. Uh, uh, hey, man. Uh, Mr. Martin, I'm a native speaker of Brazilian Portuguese, and I would like to know how to look more a native, look more a native speaker of the United States. I'm guessing you want to sound more like a, like a native United States English speaker. Is that what you're saying? If so, uh, do this. <laughs> Learn English like a native. That's what we do. Uh, and that's how you get fluent in Portuguese, I'm guessing. Uh, but that's how you would get fluent in English, too. Mike, uh, could you tell us if uh, there is any scientific proof about the good efficiency of your method to study English? Thanks. Um, well, if you're looking for studies about that, I've talked uh, about a couple of these. If you go to my site, so go to EnglishAnyone.com. Uh, and you will find we have a link to a couple of different studies, I think, that talk about that. There's some recent articles we have. I was actually talking with a, another friend of mine. This is a woman I met uh, not that long ago here in Japan. Um, and she had told me, uh, like she's a, like an IELTS teacher, I think. This is a Japanese woman. But she was telling me about some other research that was going on about this same kind of stuff that I teach. Uh, so what happens, like you can, if you go to the... Uh, what video is that? So on my channel, I did a live video about like your brain on ESL or EFL lessons. And so most people who are learning the traditional way, they have a lot going on in their head and it becomes very frustrating and they get uh, exhausted very quickly because they're trying to think and translate in their head. Uh, when they speak in English, but native speakers do not do that. So fluent speakers are just able to communicate. Like right now, it's I could speak for a long time. It's not frustrating or difficult for me to do that um, because I I haven't I'm not trying to think and translate uh, in my head or think about grammar rules. So there is there are like lots of uh, very basic reasons why this would work, uh, and so it should be kind of. Uh, even without having some scientific studies, you can you can feel the fluency developing as you learn the right way. Uh, Stephen Krashen is another example. So if you if you look that up, uh, but you can click on the link for Fluent for Life uh, in the description below this video, and you can learn more about that as well. So we talk about some of Stephen Krashen's work, uh, but there really isn't a better way I've found to become a fluent speaker. <clears throat> other than what everybody does to learn their native language. So if you learn English as a native speaker, you will speak like a native. It's, it's really that simple. And the reason people struggle is because they don't learn that way. All right. Um, all right, let's see. Let's see. Mike. Okay, I answered that one already. So native English speakers have learned everything in their language. They've learned science, philosophy for years. English learners need time to reach fluency, but they'll never speak like a native. <clears throat> yes, you can, you can argue about this and say, well, like my friend, you know, he lived in an English speaking country or this guy, like he learned about nuclear physics or whatever in, in English. And it's like, great. You know, we're, we're, if you're really talking about everyday communication and how quickly you would be able to communicate with other people and have good conversations, it's actually very quick. And if you remember, even using the native speaker example, when I'm looking at my kids or any other kids who are learning the language, they know fewer words, fewer words, fewer words. All right, so less, less vocabulary, fewer words uh, than a lot of people watching this video right now, but they still communicate better, all right? A lot of them do. And the point is they've had more time and they've spent more time with that vocabulary. They really understand that vocabulary well, while lots of English learners are trying to learn more vocabulary. So it's not about where you live, it's about how you learn the language. And yes, you can argue, well, uh, my, like, I didn't learn that, like some, I don't know, I didn't see some movie or take a class in whatever science or something like that to learn some specific vocabulary. But a lot of native speakers don't know things as well. I don't know a lot of things for biology or other life sciences. I, I just don't know that vocabulary. So I could not communicate fluently about that. I could talk, I could have a conversation with someone and ask them questions and communicate with the vocabulary I have. But if I don't know like, I don't know, nucleus or I don't know, cell wall or like other, you know, specific things like that, I just don't know that vocabulary. But that doesn't have much to do with fluency. That's just... It's just like knowledge that you're adding on to your ability to speak. <clears throat> but I can speak fluently even if I don't know about something and I could still have a conversation about that. Okay. Um, let's see. 
All right, I answered those already. How are we doing for time here? Ah, oh, we're still doing okay. All right. Um, so you don't need money, Mr. Drew? Well, pass it over here. Well, I'm not, I, I don't need any donations. <laughs> I'm always happy to have people, uh, people pay me for, for lessons, but I don't, I don't really like just like people donating money. I don't have, so I don't have a way to do that. It's like either if you like what I do, then buy the programs. If you don't like what I do, you probably shouldn't be watching these videos. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to have some more money. <clears throat> uh, let's see. I have been learning idioms and phrasal herbs. I'm going to hit the hay. Nice, nice. See you later. Uh, I use I use Duolingo basic languages. Okay. Yeah, I've tried Duolingo. I didn't really like it very much. I was testing it out. But if people are enjoying uh, learning that way, then great. Uh, I think your videos are very helpful. Glad to hear it. Let's see. I had learned about 5,000 English words to the moment to run. I run into your videos and then I found that I thought I can't use them. <laughs> yes, I don't want to laugh at that, Anne, but this is a common thing. It's not your fault if this has happened to you. This is the way everybody teaches the language. Uh, but part of it is also human psychology, where we are always trying to learn something new rather than deepen our understanding of something. It's like a young, a young child, not a child, but like a young person that wants to start a business. Business. And so they, they get very excited and they start a business uh, trying to sell whatever, like sell hot dogs or something. And then they get bored of it within a month. And then they say, well, that business didn't work. <laughs> it's like, well, there are lots of you know, businesses that sell hot dogs and make you know, millions, if not billions of dollars. So it's nothing about the business. It's just, will you spend time focusing on something or not? So we, we get around this problem by, uh, by trying to help people review in different ways. So this is the naturally varied review we use to help people learn vocabulary. <clears throat> so then I started to use your method and it takes much more time, but it works. Yeah. So at the beginning, at the beginning, you're, you're switching to this way of learning and yet it feels like it's a little bit slower. Uh, but when you start speaking more confidently, like, yeah, it, it works. All right. So again, like I have to take you from the age you are now. I can't take you from when you were a child. But even young children, when they're learning a language, it still takes them uh, many years. Like if they like, because as a baby, they're not saying anything for the first two years or whatever, uh, and they start using some vocabulary. But most of that is just input that they're getting. And if you're efficient with that, you can get fluent very quickly. Uh, I'm still here. Just wanted to say the idiom to hit the hay. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, this channel is underrated. Yeah, well, if you'd like to make it rated better, then recommend it to more people. Yes, indeed. I meant English native speakers have studied many things, and I mean something from everything. Yeah, but again, it's it's not uh, difficult to get some of this information as well if you if you do it efficiently. And so you can learn a little bit of science, a little bit of uh, literature, a little bit of other things like that, so you're prepared in conversations. So it's like me. I can have I can use uh, native Japanese references in my conversations from TV shows or books or other things like that because I've been more efficient about the, like the uses of those or like the use of that uh, for learning that thing. Uh, so I want to focus on things that are very common and that's why native, uh, the, the way we teach in Fluent for Life has all these uh, focuses on different topics. So you don't need to spend like years in college to learn about science to have a conversation about that. If you learn a lot of the basic things uh, and some uh, like a, a couple of cool additional phrases that will impress people, that will help you a lot in conversations. <clears throat> I give up learning English. Oh no, you gave up, don't give up. Adele says the pronunciation of are there in a sentence is tough. Are there, are there, are there. I didn't expect. I don't. I don't mean native speakers are experts in science. Yes, I'm just saying. Like you, like don't don't put limitations on on your ability to improve by by trying to compare. Like what is a native speaker? Like does a native speaker know? I don't know. Like this many scientific words or whatever. <clears throat> um, all right. So which one is better, British or American accent? I don't know. I wouldn't say it's better. It just depends on where you where you live. If you need to speak with more British speakers, then learn with a British accent. So what we do in Fluent for Life is we actually give you British English, American English, uh, English from Canada, United States, like even different places in the United States, because you will hear different speakers anywhere in the world. Uh, you really hit the head, uh, hit the nail on the head with this lesson. Glad to hear it, Esteban. Uh, Olga says, I don't pretend to speak like a native. I like my own accent. My boyfriend says I have 
a special sound that works for me. The most important thing is to reach the best level of connection to connect with people. Yep. All right, look at that. I think we got through everybody. And if I think somebody said I didn't answer their question before, I don't remember, but it's better just put your question again. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions, I'll hang around for one last minute here uh, to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. I think I didn't answer a question from a previous stream, which is why I teach. So I thought I would answer that very quickly here. Uh, and it's because I know what it's like to struggle to learn languages. So most of my uh, like beginning of, of learning languages for the first, I don't know, like 15 years or so, uh, learning, trying to learn Latin, French, uh, Spanish and uh, Japanese, even in Japan, I still couldn't speak. But it was finally when I learned to speak or when I understood this about uh, learning English as a first language, but in my case, learning Japanese as a first language, that's when I finally became fluent. So I like seeing other people learn things and especially my own kids when they discover something like, oh yeah, like the word remote. I like seeing uh, people learn things and that's why I teach. <clears throat> Uh, advise and advice. What is the difference? Well, advise is you're like telling people to do something and advice is the specific information you're giving them. Why don't you do a podcast explaining the meanings of different words on different topics? Uh, I do have a podcast and I've covered that, uh, like stuff like that before, but we, uh, all the, the information about, uh, how to learn and all the specific, the, like the stuff that gets you fluent, we've already done all that. It's all finished for people in Fluent for Life. Uh, so I don't really need to go back and, and do all that for the people who would like help to get that information uh, and they want to get it systematically and get fluent very quickly. That's what we do um, in that. But I don't really need to. This, this is why I actually don't spend a lot of time making uh, YouTube videos about like learning vocabulary and stuff. I suppose I could do a few more. Um, this one, I just thought it would be an interesting way to combine vocabulary learning with uh, the principle of learning English as a first language. So hopefully you have enjoyed this video. Um, but a lot of the vocabulary stuff uh, on YouTube already is like, here are some grammar points or here is, I don't know, 10 phrases for travel or, you know, whatever, something like that. Uh, but often it's not it's not very memorable for people um, because usually like learning something with a YouTube video, even watching one of my videos, I think they're good videos, but you still need a lot more review to remember that information. Uh, let's see. Uh, Yuxel was asking, how can I improve my pronunciation? Uh, you should get Frederick. If you click on the link in the description below this, you can get that app. Uh, and this is where you can actually listen to me pronounce uh, words and teach you the rules of pronunciation step by step so you will sound more like an American English speaker if you're trying to do that uh, but that's how you should be learning the language and it will also uh, also uh, help you understand how to connect words in sentences uh, do we need to learn the IPA in order to give us a sound like a native English speaker uh, no uh, when often we will get questions like this like do I need to do this? Like, ask yourself, does a native do that? So most native speakers do not know the international phonetic alphabet, and that means you don't need to know that either. It might be helpful. Some people like knowing that information, but for me, I'd rather just go directly to the language. I don't want to go IPA to Japanese. I want to go directly to Japanese and learn it the same way a native speaker would learn it. <clears throat> Could you please repeat the name of your site slower? Just click on the link in the description below this video. So EnglishAnyone.com is the site, but you can find the links right below this video. Are you watching Demon Slayer? Uh, no, I don't. No, I haven't. I know the uh, that's uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba, I think, um, the Japanese. But yeah, I've, I've heard of that, and I know it's popular, but no. I'm actually like reading Doraemon right now. <laughs> So that's uh, another Japanese comic. This other thing, uh, Demon Slayer, began uh, as a comic as well. Um, but yes, I'm sure in the future I will, I will get to something like that. <clears throat> right, teacher, let's see. Mom, it says, why do learners tend to start thinking about how to build a sentence when they talk or respond in a real conversation? Uh, you should watch the video I did, uh, was that last week, I think. If you look for... Uh, just go go back after you finish this one about the live. Uh, it's the live videos on our channel. Um, what's the name of it though? It's like how to connect uh, how to connect words in sentences fluently. I forget exactly what the title of the video is, but you'll see like a chain 
on the video thumbnail. And that's where I'm talking about people not getting fluent in individual words and phrases, and that's why they can't make larger sentences. So if you can't, if you can't use individual words and phrases fluently, if you don't feel very confident about that, then you won't be able to use higher level things like a sentence. All right, so it's just like having the pieces of something. So a chain, uh, if you have a weak link in the chain, like a, a word you don't know, then of course that will break the chain and then you can't speak fluently for that conversation or for that sentence, I should say. All right, so watch that video, but it really talks about using uh, learning vocabulary fluently so you understand and can actually uh, use those things uh, correctly and automatically in a conversation. Adele says, arigato. Hi, everybody. I'm from Indonesia, still learning English. It's a great lesson. Thank you, teacher. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. Let's see. Oh, he hasn't. Let's see. I don't know if that was. Oh, oi, kawaii doraemon desu ka? Yes, uh, very cute. Uh, oh, arigato ne. Oh, we've got some Japanese speakers in the house. Uh, I really do, I really don't mind if you take a breath or take a break for drinking water. <laughs> yes, I will enjoy. I don't have my mint tea today. So I like I like talking. I just forget, you know. Ah, all right. So I will, I will recover Olga again. Drew, thanks uh, because you spend time doing everything to prepare the class and it is a treasure. Furthermore, it is fun. You are very patient with all of us. Very thankful. Now, it's my pleasure. Pronunciations, I think. Well, I answered that question already. Please take care of your throat. <laughs> yes, I'll be okay. I don't see, I don't actually spend a lot of my day talking. Usually I'm reading things or, or learning or on the computer doing something. So I don't, like, this is my, like, I do all of my talking at one time. And then the rest of the day, I won't say much. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, let's see. How can we apply NVR on our own? So you're talking about naturally varied review, I'm guessing. Um, if you watch the, the video about uh, making espresso, that's one way to do it. So go back. That's another video you can watch on our channel. Um, so uh, just to explain to everybody, so naturally varied review, this is how we're trying to get lots of input. <laughs> Uh, the example with remote is one example of naturally varied review with my daughter. So she learns remote control and she just knows, well, the name of this thing is just remote. But that doesn't mean anything to her yet. It's only when she gets another example of like a remote island that she's thinking, ah, okay, like they mean far away. So remote is something that means far, like a remote jungle would be far away. All right. So notice how like... Usually if you hear something, you get one example, it doesn't really help you use it fluently. It's also not very memorable. So my daughter, uh, or both of them, they hear the word remote over and over and over again because I'd say like, you know, change the channel or put the remote down or whatever. Uh, but hearing remote islands or remote lands, that helps them actually understand and make that connection. So when you want to get naturally varied review by yourself, uh, so this is what we do in Fluent for Life, but if you're not in the program, you can just try to do, uh, try to do this by yourself. Uh, the only difficult thing is where you need to get lots of explanations about something. So if you don't understand the vocabulary, it's really valuable to have a teacher there. You can learn much faster that way. Uh, but if you're doing it by yourself, you can, with enough review, get, get that understanding the same way natives are getting it. So I gave you one example of that in the Espresso video. So watch that video. Is this live now, Cicely? Yes, it is, but it's almost not live anymore, and then people can come back and watch it later. All right, when is the next live, Drew? Can you tell me? Uh, probably next Monday. Yes, a remote job. Excellent. Excellent usage of that. Remote job. But notice how, like, each time you get that, so the first time, I've given this example before, but if I put some uh, flashcards on the, on the board and I'm trying to teach you a new language, like an alien language or something... Uh, let's see. So let's say I, I draw this. So I'm a teacher uh, in a classroom, and I, I well, I just say this is we'll just call this a uh, an UG. UG. So I show you a flashcard, and I say UG. And then, like your your brain doesn't really know for sure. You're you're still you've learned something. Okay, I, I associate this picture. <coughs> with this sound, but I still don't know 100% what that means. So if you can think about 
like a target being here. Like I can think, eh, maybe it means, it could mean airplane. It could mean flying. It could mean a vehicle. It could mean a shape. It could mean lots of different things. So it's only when I give you more examples that you really feel very confident. Your, your confidence increases and your doubt decreases. So you can use that thing. So if I give you another example like this one, uh, and, and this is also UG. Now you're like, ooh, like, well, that, that, that changed something in your mind, just like this remote example. So we have remote control, remote island, remote work. It's like, ah, okay, we're talking about far away. So this one, ooh, I bet, I bet he means some kind of vehicle or transportation or something like that. I give you another flashcard. Here's a boat. <coughs> this is UG also. Okay, we're talking about transportation or vehicles, all right? So you become more confident each time you get an example. This is a basic physical example that you might give to kids, but it's the same thing with the remote example as well. All right, ugh. <laughs> yes, <coughs> so I don't want anyone to come to the video later and think I'm teaching them some English. This is not English, this doesn't mean anything, but I can demonstrate this using like an alien language about how people process information. So if I tell you something and, it, and a, teacher, a teacher understands, so they don't, they don't really like think about it very much. So the teacher understands like, ugh, don't you remember? Like what is ugh? But really the student is like, uh, I'll feel bad. Like the teacher will feel bad if I don't remember this, you know? <laughs> like I'll look like a stupid student if I don't remember and so nobody says anything. So the teacher doesn't say anything, the student doesn't say anything and then no learning really happens, okay? So people forget what they're learning. But as you get, if you spend a bit more time with something, I promise you, if you spend a little bit more time with things, you will feel much more confident about them and that's how you will speak fluently. It's not about trying to repeat things, like I go in a conversation and I try to use the word ugh. I won't feel confident about that if I don't first understand what it means, all right? So this is why I want to spend a lot of time really feel confident, really understand that thing well, and then naturally I will want to speak, okay? So fluency comes with the understanding of the language. It's not by you trying to repeat words and phrases to other people. And you can feel it in your mind. You can feel the, the improvement in your mind when you're like, ah, that's the aha moment. The aha moment where you actually feel yourself understanding something. Ah, now I get it. Okay, when you have that feeling, then you're ready to speak, all right? But you don't need to force yourself to speak before that. The speech is the result of understanding like this, all right? Everybody get that? Hopefully this makes sense, but this is how you learn English. Uh, like, notice in a, in a regular, like, everyday uh, conversation or the way, like, native, native children would be learning, they might just get one example. So they hear their parents talking about something like, ugh, okay? Uh, and maybe they don't really know what's, what that is, but maybe two weeks later they get another example, and maybe three weeks later they get another example, and then finally that it took like a month for them to really understand what that meant. But it's, it's not the, the actual length of time, it's just when they got the ex example. So if I can give you three examples at the same time, that's where you will feel very confident about that. So this is why we do this in Frederick as well. So in the app, there are four different icons for each of the words, okay? So when you're going through them, you might see the first icon and like, oh, I don't really know what that means. But as you look at a couple, and maybe you can even get a few more by yourself, that will really help you understand the vocabulary like a native. <clears throat> okay, what 100 likes, 100 likes, congratulations. All right, thank you. Yes, we need millions of likes. <laughs> we got to get millions of viewers first. Let's see. What oh, the pterodactyl from Taiwan. Nice to see you here. All right. Uh, Julia, is it okay to study English by watching cartoons like Peppa Pig? Can I improve my English by watching movies without subtitles? Yeah. So remember, the, the, the goal is first to understand the language and then get lots of examples. That's it. So if you're watching Peppa Pig or whatever other movies you want to watch, it doesn't matter about subtitles. You should really be watching it with English subtitles rather than using uh, your native language. So you don't want translations in what you're learning, uh, but you should be getting, uh, if you need to read, that's certainly fine. Sometimes I will watch Japanese things and have the subtitles in Japanese. Um, and it's actually interesting, like in Japan, there's so much text 
on the screen for Japanese TV. That's probably one of the reasons why people become good readers, because they just see the vocabulary again and again written on the screen. Uh, it's something very different from English television. Uh, but yes, so use English subtitles. If you want to use subtitles, that's fine. But yeah, watch cartoons. Watch stuff for Peppa Pig. Actually, a lot, a lot of people, especially people who follow my channel or other people uh, who know a lot of English but don't speak, it's really because they don't know the language well enough. And so they would really benefit from watching Peppa Pig or other things that have maybe the, the vocabulary is a little bit easier, but it really covers the basics very well. So people might worry about, do I say in or on, or like, is my pronunciation correct? But if you focus on the basics and get a lot of that, a lot of those examples, like for me, even learning Japanese, I still go back to reviewing the basics sometimes. If I'm like, Gee, I wonder if I'm using that correctly, and I'll go back and get a whole bunch of examples for something, then like, ah, okay, now I'm feeling confident about that thing. And now, like, when I feel confident, then I'm in the conversation and uh, feel much more in control, and I'm, I'm able to enjoy myself much more. <clears throat> All right, hopefully that makes sense. All right, Mohammed says, so does that mean we should take the words that we already know and spend time to understand them, or we just need to do that with new words? It's just any, anything that you don't feel confident about using. So if you're in a conversation, Mohammed, uh, and, and you, there's a word you want to say, but you don't watch or you, don't, uh, or you, you still feel nervous about saying that, then you should review that vocabulary. If you already know the vocabulary and you use it well, then use it. You know, you don't have to feel bad about that. <clears throat> uh, but just review what you need to review. Uh, but don't watch Teletubbies, yes. So Teletubbies is probably going to give... Uh, I don't even know if they use... There, I think there is some regular English in that. Don't watch stuff for babies because there's a lot of stuff that, like, it's like... Like even even like too low. Sometimes it's just like baby talk in in words uh, or in like stuff for really little kids. But something for kindergartners is really good. I like the uh, stuff I, my kids watch. You know they'll watch uh, like like Peppa Pig is a good example actually. Uh, but yeah, I mean unless you just like watching the Teletubbies themselves, like woo, like walking around. You know, <laughs> it's funny that show is still on the Teletubbies. All right, what time is it? All right, now it's time to shut it down. Uh, but hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. Guys, show your support by liking this video if you learned something from the teacher. This is a precious channel. Yes, uh, Eunice. And I do appreciate people giving me, like challenging me on ideas. And if they're thinking like, well, I don't know if this works or is this like a provable thing? Is this guy serious? Can you really become a better speaker without speaking? Yes. All right, but I encourage you to try these things for yourself. Hopefully, at the beginning of this video, you should already have learned some of these things and, and you felt much more confident. Maybe you've heard them before, but now you feel even more confident because, again, as you get more examples of something, you will feel more confident. You will feel less doubt about these particular words and phrases, and that's what will allow you to use them fluently. And I'm trying to help you feel motivated and excited to speak by, uh, by really just understanding the language like a native. When you do that, you will feel much more confident. Uh, let's see, Nikita from Nikita, you are so amazing. I use your strategies to gain confidence in English speaking that really works. Glad to hear. Yeah, again, this is the same thing you're doing to learn your English or to learn your native language. Uh, it's the same thing you're doing to learn English if you want to become a fluent speaker. Greetings from the Red Planet. Yes, got a lot of people. Actually, we have a lot of people from uh, outer space watching today's video. We got somebody from Planet X. I think a few people from Mars, maybe somebody on the moon, I think. Uh, Sardis says, do you still live in Japan? Yes, I'm in uh, Nagasaki, Japan right now. Learning English with those little animals isn't too childish, I think. <laughs> yes, remember, don't, don't be a snob. All right, a snob is like, well, I'm not watching Peppa Pig because that's for kids. You know, it's like it, you should be watching Peppa Pig. It's a really good show, and there are lots of actual adult jokes in that show. All right, so if you if you pay attention, like th those the the people who make those shows, they know how to write a good show that's for kids and also for adults. So there are many many jokes that the kids might not get. Uh, but the adults will find them funny. And so sometimes my kids are watching a show and I laugh at a joke and they, they look at me like, what am I laughing at? <laughs> but it was because it was a joke for, uh, for older people. Uh, you will find this in Disney movies a lot, actually. <clears throat> 
I'm from Uzbekistan and I love to watch your videos. It really helped me a lot. I'm glad to hear. Uh, when's your next class? How is your schedule? Please let us know. Yes, I don't really have a schedule for these, but you will probably find me here at this time a week from today. So next Monday, Japanese time. If I'm going to learn English like this, I prefer Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, Pluto, Walt Disney characters, less Teletubbies. Yes, so pick whatever you like, whatever that is, Ninja Turtles, uh, or, you know, whatever, anything else you like. I used to work as a truck driver and playing your videos while I drive. Nice. <laughs> yes, as long as you're getting the review, get that review, you will become a more confident speaker. All right. Now, before I lose my voice completely, I would like to say goodbye. You have a lovely family. We can. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure helping you all learn. I hope you all have a fantastic day. If you would like more help, this is what we do. Uh, a lot of this stuff is just giving you simple examples uh, but it's telling a lot of like the theory and how we get fluent like this. But if you'd like help step by step, this is what you can do in Fluent for Life. You can just click on the link in the description and I will see you guys all in the next video. Bye-bye.